I wanted to be a boy and I, 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 I was very, very vehement and strong in that. I was defined by it. I was kind of the, the kind of crazy kid in town. Everybody knew me. And everywhere I went, people would say, are you a boy or a girl? And I'd kind of go, no. Did you have a boy name? I mean, so I'm very glad I didn't transition. But had I been asked way back in those lonely days, I would have sailed the seven seas for puberty blockers. I would have... <laughs> it was an awful time. I, I would have loved to have the opportunity. What would be different about you now had you been on a few years of those puberty blockers? Well, this is the first generation that are being told you actually are a girl or you actually are a boy, that we've never done this with these children. To tell them that they can take drugs to stop all that and to stop their periods and stop sexual development is incredibly authoritarian. And so I think that's really, really dangerous. It's a sad, horrible world for these kids. Why is trans activism dangerous for kids, Stella? Um, I think that when, uh, I think there's nothing more seductive or alluring for a child to be told that you can be a different person, especially if you're an unhappy child, maybe with autism, or maybe if you're, if you're, uh, you know, maybe you, you've got same sex attraction, but you don't quite know it yet. You just know you're different. Um, I think that the, the promise that you can be a different person with a different identity, with a different name, and nobody will be able to kind of refer to your old self is extraordinarily attractive and so why is it dangerous it's because gullible kids not the savvy kids the gullible naive kids fall into this concept of I could be somebody different and that's what's wrong with me and human to be human is often to be filled with angst and distress and self-loathing and if somebody had told me at the wrong time during my life you can be someone else and nobody would be able to refer to that old shameful humiliated self I just said where do I sign in I go this is quite apart from the fact I had my own gender issues the entire extraordinary mental concept of you could be a different person is what I object to for children because it's a lie. You can never be a different person. There's a great line from John Kabat-Zinn, the old mindfulness guru, and he's he's written a book called Wherever You Go, There You Are. And you, you're never going to get away from yourself. I'm never going to get away from myself. And these kids think they can become a different person. I suppose when I, I think about this sometimes, um, and I, I, that, it might offend some people, but when you're a kid, there's a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and you, avatars. It's a really obsessed, they're obsessed with that kind of thing. I don't think I did that that much. I'm trying to remember. Oh no, I, I would. I would become a football player. I would be that football player and I would have his name on my back. And I would imagine when I played football yeah. uh, badly that I was that player. And it's escapism, I suppose. Uh, typically, that's not very dangerous. So what is what is different when, when we're talking about trans? Oh, I would be all for trans activism if it didn't have the the, the kind of the threat and the offer of medicalization, because medicalization is the issue. You know, if somebody wants to explore their identity and become the opposite sex for a little while and to kind of, you know, explore their identity, I, I don't actually think that that would be a problem if there wasn't the threat of medicalization. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea that these children could stop their actual sexual development and stop any sexual attraction happening. We don't know what happens when somebody takes puberty blockers. This is, a, you know, not even an experiment, because if there was an experiment, there would be another control group. This is just treating children with drugs that we don't know what's going to happen with. But it stops their sexual development. And so they're out of sync with their peers. So when everybody else is fancying people, and you know, pre-fancying, I've really thought about this a lot. There's a time where you're you're kind of in the pre-fancying people stage and you can have these kind of extraordinary crushes and this, all sorts is going on in adolescence that we haven't really figured out. To tell them that they can take drugs to stop all that and to stop their periods and stop sexual development is incredibly authoritarian and disruptive for the for the natural growth of of the human brain and so i think that's really really dangerous kind of um intervention to bring about children but there's more to that you know there's there's other things happening online to lots of children that they're kind of getting led into a world that is very unsavory and incredibly sexualized. And it's very easy to turn on, for example, a teenage boy. And a lot of teenage boys are getting turned on 
into kind of a world that they're it's way over their head. I work with them because I'm a psychotherapist and they're telling me things and they are so far over their head sexually. And yet they've never been kissed and they've never had any sort of real life physical mm. um, kind of development. So it's it's a sad, horrible world for these kids. Yeah, before I ask you about t- to what extent um, kids actually are being medicalized, give us a brief rundown of your background. Okay, <laughs> It's hard to go brief. <laughs> um, well, I suppose in this context, it's important to know that I had my own issues as a kid, as gender from as far back as I go. So about three, I wanted to be a boy and I, 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 I was very, very vehement and strong in that. I was very good at being a boy. I could beat up all the boys. I could climb faster and, cl- you know, run faster and climb higher and stuff. And I was very insistent and persistent and consistent with this for years. It lasted many years. And... I was defined by it. I was kind of the the kind of crazy kid in town. Everybody knew me. Mm. And everywhere I went, people would say, are you a boy or a girl? And I'd kind of go, no. Did you have a boy name? No, I didn't. Back then, pronouns and a name. I was I was naive enough to think Stella was an unusual name. I kind of got away with it. Mm. I'm the beer. I'm, I'm the sort of <laughs> masculine beer, Stella. Um, uh, pronouns, I wouldn't have even known what a pronoun was. You know yeah. what I mean? So it was a very different time. But for example, like our school... You know, the girls wore pinafores in, in primary and the boys wore trousers. And I uh, chose not to wear a pinafore, but I didn't wear the boys' grey flannel trousers. I just wore my own jeans. Mm. So it was kind of a nod to an in-between state. What's a pinafore? Skirt? Yeah, little dress, yeah. tartan dress. Oh. So I never wore one. I was the only kid in the school who didn't wear one. Do you know what I mean? And this was a time when every girl wore this. Nobody did uniform flexibility back in the 80s or 70s or whatever. So it was very unusual that I was allowed, but they didn't build a policy around me. They didn't make new rules around me. I didn't get a sense of power and I'm I'm dictating what's going down. They just looked the other way. Odd kid, let her go. Do you know what I mean? Let's see. And nobody brought me to a psychiatrist. Nobody diagnosed me. I now know enough because I've immersed myself in this field to know that I would have been diagnosed with very classic, typical childhood onset gender dysphoria. But anyway, I went through puberty and puberty was harrowing. It was really difficult. It was a horrible time. Really, really sad, lonely time. Not nice at all because I was trying to navigate moving from being a boy to being a girl and my sexual development was happening. It was awful. Anyway, Life went on. I ultimately became comfortable in my own skin, ultimately became a mother in my 30s. Very happy. Best thing that ever happened to me. So I'm very glad I didn't transition. But had I been asked way back in those lonely days, I would have sailed the seven seas for puberty blockers. I would have. (laughs) It was an awful time. I, I would have loved to have the opportunity. How might that have affected you today? Like, what, what would be different about you now had you been on a few years of those puberty blockers? Well, it would have changed my life. <laughs> I thought you were it, sort of showing your body, like, no, well, I, look at <laughs> this, everyone. <laughs> no, don't. Well, Please well, don't. <laughs> look at it this. Can you imagine if I hadn't been through puberty? <laughs> no, Sorry. no, that's not what I was saying. It would have changed my life because I had all these intense crushes, intense, intense. And it's interesting because I've heard quite a few of those RGD girls telling me that they had similar, this over-the-top obsession, stalky stuff about r- various different people. And um, that impacted me because I realised I needed to up my game. I needed to be more socially... Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, nobody's realising that that happens to loads of adolescents, that they come from being completely absorbed. I want the cake. I want the present. Get out of me, way. me, me, me. That's the childlike state. Then you realise when you go through puberty and a sexual awakening, you also go through a love awakening that you're looking for a mate for life. And you start trying to be attractive for the people that you fancy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And you become a more socially engaged person as a result. All of that happened to me. And I don't think that should be dismissed. This is phenomenal changes. And I realized somewhere in the midst of my crazy, stalky obsessions that I needed to become more female if any of these fellas were going to fancy me. Because when I was walking around like this, they, they certainly weren't. And so it brought me to my female self. Having a sexual awakening brought me to my femaleness. And then them when I ended up being with with um, different people and them loving my body brought me around to my body. So the interaction of other humans is essential. And that's a sexual awakening that has stopped. I would have stayed in that pu- pre-puberty childlike state, not fancying anybody, me, me, me. 
And then ultimately, if I was to follow the kind of playbook of what happens now, I would have got puberty blockers around about 11 or so. Stayed in a childlike state, never quite fancying anybody else, out of sync, but also not having all those awakenings. And then at 18, taking testosterone, maybe got a mastectomy, masculine my, masculinized my face. And I wouldn't have had kids and I would have, wouldn't have had fallen in love and I've, I wouldn't have had sexual satisfaction. I wouldn't yeah. have had a good sex life. All of that would be gone to me. And, you know, I arguably most importantly, I, I don't think I would, well, I certainly wouldn't have married my husband. He wouldn't have fancied me if I looked like that. Um, and who else, you know, the other people who fell in love with me and I fell in love with, I don't think any of that would have happened. It would have been a very different life, but most importantly, I wouldn't have had kids. We did a really interesting thought experiment of Peter Boghossian. You know, he oh, does yeah. this street epistemology. And it was, um, if an alien came down and gave your spouse the opposite genitals, would you be able to make it? work and we were sort of all over the place because we're going well it's not her fault that this has happened to her how could I possibly leave her but then I'm not attracted to those things and how could I break it to her that I'm so sorry that these aliens came down and did this to you but also on top of that I'm gonna have to leave you I don't know what the answer is whoa 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 <laughs> was this just two men speaking this was just me and Peter in the pub and then okay. this, this was um this was Peter and then we had it was me and Yasmin Mohammed. Of, of all people. Is ex, Yasmin ex a woman? She's ex-Muslim, yes. Yeah. Uh, and a couple of other women. It just strikes me as a very male way of thinking. I, like if my husband was given genitals, female genitals today, I would be very sympathetic. I wouldn't be leaving him. Right. So, yeah, I <laughs> Jesus think Christ, I did say leap. I was the one I standing. I would be having sex with them, but I wouldn't be leaving. <laughs> Sorry, pity about you. <laughs> I think I was standing at the leaving and the three women were all at the staying point. But you know what, though? There is a difference because a woman... Wow. I'm going to be... This is very, like... A, a I bit, suddenly tried to check to see if you're married. I'm being a bit facetious here, but for an alien to come down and give a man female genitalia... It still feels quite sort of, and obviously I'm I'm biased because I'm a straight man, but it feels quite sort of clean and and uh, unintrusive. Whereas to give a woman male genitalia, if the aliens did that, that's like a big thing that's suddenly there. No, no. So I would if like to. If my husband got breasts, <clears throat> it would feel very obtrusive. Right. Having had this conversation now, I would like to make it clear <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You've that lost should it. <laughs> said aliens come down, that my beautiful fiance, uh, I wouldn't tell anyone, so I would save her honour and I would stay with her good. regardless uh -huh. for a good few days and see <laughs> see what happens after well, that. Maybe the difference is I'm 20 years married and have kids and I, I think I'd stick with him. I'd be very sympathetic and I wouldn't be having sex with him, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave him. What about hand? No, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was <laughs> Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> what we, move on from the facetious stuff. What is early onset gender dysphoria? Right, early onset is 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 a small number of kids throughout history, as far as we can see, wanted to be the opposite sex. And uh, they didn't know anything about other gender identities and that's what they wanted to be. And um, research shows that the, the likelihood of these kids being same sex attracted is very high, especially among boys. We're talking 80, 90 percent and also among girls, kind of 78 percent. So, you know, you can you can certainly see that the likelihood of these kids to grow up to be gay or lesbian or bisexual is very high. I see. And uh, they've always existed. And um, it's this is the first generation that are being told you actually are a girl or you actually are a boy that we've never done this with these children. What we've done is had various forms of oppression. We've tried to hustle them into being boys more kind of stereotypically and masculine or stereotypically feminine or, you know, whatever. But we've never actually told them to be the opposite, to go, you feel like a, a boy will then go and present as a boy and have he, him pronouns and go into the boys uh, changing room and stuff like that. By the way, I did go into the boys changing room a few times as a kid. Mm. Like I say, people just looked away. I was just an eccentric kid. An important part of early onset gender dysphoria is the whole town knows it. When they are young, like me, three or four, they're just coming into consciousness and they think, I want to be that. And they're, they're kind of almost they feel omnipotent enough to think that they could be, that pure force of will will be make them be perceived. It's very childlike, you know. And generally the whole town knows about it. There's no self-consciousness. They are just proclaiming it. But 
recently, in about the last decade, there's been an extraordinary rise in an unknown cohort that has never been seen in the medical literature before, unlike the early onset, which is the late onset gender dysphoria, which is kind of um, adolescence, who suddenly, after an extended period of time on the computer, suddenly, um, often after a trauma, very often after a trauma, a lot of them are neurodiverse, such as autism or OCD or ADHD and eating disorders, anxiety, um, as well as neurodiversity. Um, they suddenly proclaim that they are another gender and it might not be another gender identity. It might be something like non-binary or trans mask. It's not necessarily the opposite sex. It's much more complex and it's often very secretive and it's much more um, it's a much more private kind of scenario that's going on. They've never been seen before in the medical literature. They've never presented while we've got a very steady small number of kids who always were like that. Mm. So we're kind of, we're in unknown ter territory here. Do you think you might be biased by your experiences? Because obviously you're now so relieved that you didn't get yeah. pushed into this. Uh, aren't there many trans adults who are saying, oh, and, and also it, it is just a fact and we don't want to think about it, but and, and I, I don't think that children should be medicalized, but I'm just from sort of steel man there arguing yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, that, you know, if I wanted to present as a woman, I wouldn't want to have an Adam's apple and I would want to get it done as soon as possible to be as happy as I can presenting as a woman. A hundred percent I'm biased. Yeah, yeah. I'm completely biased. There's no doubt about it. But sometimes somebody's experience can bring insight into a situation. Um, to finish my story, by the way, off I went into adulthood and then became a psychotherapist in my 30s and was a general psychotherapist, didn't touch anything to do with gender, didn't touch anything to do with any of this issue. And many, I often write and I have written a few books and I often write for the national newspapers. And, you know, gender was just arising, you know, it was just in the media, this is about 2017. So I decided to, to kind of, I was often writing about anxiety, bullying, and things like that. And I decided I, I should really write about what happened to me. Not saying that I'm an oracle. I knew nothing about the subject. All I knew is I'd had a very intense experience for many years as a kid. I wrote an article and as a result, I ended up doing a film for Channel 4 in 2018 called Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. And it's answering your question. Because the premise of the film wasn't that all these kids are like me. It was, could any of the 4,000% rise in girls seeking medical transition, could any of them be like me? Mm. So I wasn't saying you are all like me. I, was, I, was, I wasn't going anywhere near you are all like me. I was saying, could any of you be like me? Yeah. And for that question... We were vilified. I was vilified. My, my, you know, reputation was ruined. I was smeared. It's still ongoing to this day. And um, I was told I was, you know, an absolute transphobe for that. That seems insane. And 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 I, I'm pleased that you say that. You know, that the, the not everyone might be like you. God no. So that opens Quite up clearly. <laughs> it opens up a philosophical question. Then it's that kind of like, you know, do you divert a train to kill those other people or those people? If if you know, 50% are, are girls like you and 50% are girls who would be much better if they were made into boys. What the hell do we do? Well, can we go there? Yeah. So if you're a girl, right, like me, and if you go through female puberty, honestly, the impact of it is is kind of minimal insofar as you will still be able to have children in the future if you go through puberty. You will have to have a mastectomy, but testosterone does such a significant job quite quickly on testosterone, you will look male and you will probably never look female really again. So the ability for testosterone to take over the female body is pretty well established. Even after you stop taking it? Mm. You can't just it maintains, stop? Well, if you look at all the detransitioned women, the, 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 the maintenance of the masculinized face, the jaw, the oh. shoulders, the muscular. Now, it does diminish. And, you know, I haven't told you about my organization. I'll tell you in a minute because we're tracking it. But it does diminish. There is a softness that comes in. But it takes years and we're still in the middle of it. And the masculinized face, it's extraordinary, the impact. They pass much better. Much better. Buck so, Angel. Yeah, phenomenally, Smoke. absolutely passes. So the argument for a girl to take puberty blockers is very weak because actually testosterone does it. The only thing is the mastectomy. Oh. But 
the cost benefit is and you will be able to have children and you have a sexual awakening that is freeing you up to be a lesbian, which you really could well be. So I would say that you put the, the pros and cons on a sheet and anybody would say, well, obviously you should go through the sexual awakening to find out where you might land afterwards. You need to fall in love before you know where you're going to go with your love partners, if you follow me. Because when you transition, you're, you're massively impacting your pool of who's going to be attracted to you. So I, I think the female argument just is knocked out of the park for that. Now for boys this is why it was brought in was because the reason why it was brought in it's very interesting in the 1980s the Dutch clinic who brought in Dutch uh, puberty blockers in the first place they realised that an awful lot of men who were transitioning weren't really passing and as a result no as a result is a leap they also realised that a lot of these uh, trans uh, people were not happy and they put the two and two together and they decided that the not passing was very relevant to them not being happy. And so they said exactly what you said, which is, why don't we stop the puberty, stop the Adam's apple, make sure they pass. Mm. And then, then they'll go on to live happy lives. And so they had an experiment. It was a very bad experiment because they didn't have a control group. Oh. And they took 70 kids and um, there was these kids all had early onset, like me, you know what I mean? They had been since children. They had good mental health. They had passed quite stringent criteria to get into this study. And uh, they gave them puberty blockers. And it's interesting, that 70 kids was reduced mm. to 55. 15 of them pulled out. Okay. And it's like, what happened to those 15? Some of them got diabetes. Some of them got some sort of obesity. It didn't go well for them, that 15, but they got pulled out. Is this boys and girls? Boys and girls. Mm -hmm. And then there was 55 left in the study and they went on to get interventions. So they had, let's say, you know, puberty blockers at an early age. Then they had uh, testosterone or estrogen, depending on their... And then they had genital surgery or mastectomies at, let's say, 18 or 19. And then they followed up. It wasn't long after. It was about a year, year and a half after their, their, their genital surgery. They were asked, are they, you know, how are they? And they all said they were very happy. And I'm like, yeah, they were 21, 22. What the hell? You know, they'd only started out. What we needed was a long term. And how are you when you're 25 and 30 and 35? Mm. And how's it, do, how's it going for you not having kids at 35? How's it going for you with your sex life? But uh, one of those children died as a result of the surgical um, interventions. Um, because when you have puberty blockers as a little boy, your penis size stays the same, which is prepubescent. And so um, when they had to do the surgery on him, they didn't have enough penal tissue. And so they used another part of his body and it all got very complicated and he died. Now, if you look at what happened with COVID and the tests before they put out the vaccines, do you follow me? Mm. If one person died out of 55 kids or 70 kids, close up the test. It's over. Close yeah. up the study. Not a chance with that past muster. Like, it's just like, that's a dreadful, tragic absolute death of a study if somebody tragically dies as a result of the interventions. But they didn't. They kept going. They haven't followed up. They make noises about following up about these kids, but there's very little follow-up, mm. you know, and the world has taken on this this experiment. So we are starting to see the results of it because we're seeing detransitioners and we're seeing people who say, I had puberty blockers as a kid and some of them, presumably are saying this is great and some of them are saying this is dreadful and they're all very young because we're about 10, 15 years into this. So. It's so complicated and, you know, I definitely would, would say I'm gender critical um, like you and like a lot of people that I interview and the only place why I'm having a sort of cognitive, oh, I don't, you know, is we don't really have that evidence. Okay, some are detransitioning, but we don't seem to, unless you'll tell me I'm mistaken, have the evidence that this is making them unhappy. Instead, I'm, I'm always hearing trans people say, oh, it's made, it's made me happy, it saved my life and so on. It, do we have anything to suggest that, that, that it really is making most of these people miserable? Hmm. Um, we don't have evidence about anything, but hmm. we do have protocols with medical practices and least invasive first is pretty well established as a medical protocol that you don't go in, if you go into the doctor with a raging headache tomorrow, they don't operate on your brain. 
You know what I mean? What they do is least invasive first. Mm. Well, first of all, try this, then try that, then try that. And it's very, very far down the line before they will go into an irreversible intervention. So I'm not calling for a stop on everything. I'm calling for established medical practices such as least invasive first prioritised. Okay, so you wouldn't necessarily, this is the kind of thing that gets you in trouble with one's own tribe kind of thing, stop people from from, from transitioning? Um, I think uh, it's egregious to give children puberty blockers. I think it's it's just, okay. I, I, I think, where would the evidence be? I, I, I don't care. It's just such an authoritarian, high-handed thing to do to children. We have well established you don't divert children from their from their development because it's just so godlike to say i will stop your sexual development we've never done it before it's too experimental and i think no I, i'm just against it and genspect is completely against it i'll tell you about my organization in a minute so what we what, well i'll tell you now what yeah. we offer is a, a healthy approach to sex and gender because we believe that an awful lot of these approaches are unhealthy you've got helen pluckrose now yeah, I'm a big fan of Helen Pluckrose. Right. I love Helen Pluckrose. I, I, I've just never seen someone, apart from you now, get so much abuse from both sides of mm-hmm. everything all the time. Um, so Jen Specht at the moment, and that's because she's just reasonable. Could, could I just answer your first question yeah. though before you we go on to because we've loads of brilliant advisors and Helen is one of our many valued advisors. And I just had lunch with her today. Oh, yeah, she's oh, lovely. Man. Um, I just want to say about medically transitioning. We, we took the view, Jen Specht, after, like, we were, we're made up of clinicians, you know, people who've detransitioned, people who've transitioned, people who regret their transition, parents, an awful lot of different people who are working in this field, lawyers, teachers. And we took the view that, um, it is best for children not to be experimented on in this manner. We're very clear about that. Secondly, we believe prohibition doesn't work and that prohibition has been tried in various means and it is not a healthy approach to make. However, we do think that it should be clear and public awareness should be raised that the the idea to medically transition is based on certain factors that the people need to know. Informed consent should be informed consent. It should be informed. And people should be aware that they're engaging in uh, a medical intervention that doesn't have a good grounding in any sort of research that will show that they'll have a better life. Any sort of research that will show that they're doing anything except they're placing very heavy medical burden on their body and they're weakening their body. So um, with all that, you know, some people get extreme body modifications in clinics all over the world. Should they? I don't think they should. Should they benefit from maybe psychotherapy or some other help? I think they should. Should they be free to? I think a society has to uphold the freedom to do this or else we are going to have toxic clinics. And we've already had them like back room garages offering interventions that would be really, really. Um, and it's already happening. And also we'd have a uh, tourism to certain countries. So I'd, I'd prefer that it was placed exactly where it should be placed, which is in extreme body, mod, body modification that does not have a medical um, approval or medical research behind it to advise it, not a recommended procedure. This is a pure free will individual. You want to take that road. You want to move to Alaska if you want to mm. live up on the top of Everest. It's your free will, but it's not recommended. There are much easier ways to live. Problem is you tell a kid that who's like intent on changing and intent on transitioning. I, if I'm that kid, it's just going in one ear and out the other. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember I wanted these football boots that my dad, I want, and, and you know, they were like three sizes too small for me, but they were the champagne colored ones that Beckham was advertising. And I was just like, no matter how much like everyone in the shop was like, those don't fit you. Those do not fit. Your feet are scrunched up, but they were, they were no bigger sizes. And I was like, no, 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 they definitely fit wore them once, couldn't wear them again. Uh, and I would absolutely, if it was a transition, I'd have just gone like, uh-huh, 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 I'm getting it anyway. Yeah, that's irrelevant though, because parents constantly overrule children in different spheres. Yeah. So they might have let you away with your football boots. My dad because, failed me. Yeah, well, you know, was, I think he might have given you a very good lesson. Yeah, yeah, fair play. Fair play. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have said, yeah, go on then. Have knock your boots. Your, knock yourself out there. Fill your boots, quite literally. Fill your boots. <laughs> um, but uh, in this, there's two points. One, 
parents are well versed in saying, no, you can't get drunk at 12. No, you can't have sex at 13. I'm not going to uphold this and support it. No, I'm not going to let you marry at 14. The world supports this. No, we don't think tattoos should be available at a very young age. No, we don't think extreme body modification is a good idea. No, you might think that your breasts are too small. No, you're not going to get um, whatever it's called, breast augmentation at a young age. We're well used to, as parents, saying no to to a child who's not listening and you live with it. You live with it, blah, 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 blah. And so what are the rules now around consent? Because I keep hearing, particularly in the States, I'm hearing stories about a father who didn't want their kid to go through this and was overruled, and it, maybe because the mother allowed it. What are the rules here? So yeah, Genspex is an international organisation, so we're seeing all the different countries with all the different rules, and it's just, it would make you dizzy. So in some countries, in some states in America, some places like Canada and Australia, they're very punitive. They've taken away an awful lot of parents' rights. And they've made the state the kind of uh, the overruler mm. of what medical inf- interventions a child can take over their own future sex life and their future fertility. It's dystopian. It's mad. When you think about it. But other countries, you know, the UK seems to be really getting an awful lot of sense. Ireland is a little bit schizophrenic. But, you know, there's there's a lot of sensible people working in the field. It's quite noticeable that they, you know, they tried to advertise for an Irish psychiatrist in the Irish Children's Gender Service and nobody applied for over a year. Wow. I don't want to touch it. They're like, that's a minefield. I don't want to go near it. Like, I feel like here in, in England, there must be people queuing up, though, to, you know, I'm doing my gender thing, like to... I don't know. There is. You know, the affirmative is very big in Ireland, in England. There's, and there's no doubt about it. There's a very mm. strong... But there's also a very strong opposite if you follow me there's there's two sides in 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 England that are very active and very loud in Ireland it's much more underground but mm. i just thought that was a very interesting little yeah. fact yeah yeah that is it's funny that yeah i just oh man i'm so s- stressed out thinking about this now to what extent are you concerned about social contagion what role does social i remember it might have been you or helen joyce talking about anorexia uh, in Japan. Did you see that? Why? Well, yeah, I know about that. Yeah. I don't know if it was Helen Joyce or myself, but there's an awful lot of studies that have shown how, you know, for example, when Beverly Hills 90210 went to, I think it's Fiji, that the, the, there had been no bulimia. And then suddenly within two years, about 40% of the kids had, it was, for no, wow. no, the girls, teenage girls, yeah. very specific. You know what I mean? We're, we're showing signs of, of bulim, bulimic traits and bulimic behavior. So, Social contagion is very well established among teenage girls. And if you think of their traits, they ruminate, they co-empathize, they talk excessively, they identify with each other. They say, I'm like that too. No, I really am. And they really get into the waters of their friends so as to kind of get on with them. It's all very cute and sweet until it's something really destructive. And then it's awful. It's absolutely awful. So, yeah, social contagion is a massive part of it. I've just read uh, Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation, and it's frightening stuff, the impact of social media on this generation and just how much their mental health has fallen off a cliff, coinciding with the arrival of of smartphones, Mm. coinciding with the arrival of social media and the kind of the, the absolute slump in not only mental health, because you could say this is all self-reported, but things like suicide, actual completed suicide and self-harm, they're slumping as well. So there's there's an absolute frightening contagion, not only about gender, but about other mental health issues among among not only teenage girls, young people. And I think it's time that we need to actually, we, we brought in tobacco and then we realised that this is really unhealthy and it took us many years to pull out of it. But most people know about it now. The same with drunk driving. Like, you know, when I was growing up, loads of people were drunk driving. It just wasn't a big deal when I was a kid. Now it's just not acceptable. Do you know what I mean? So we have done social change. The same with seat belts, the same with car seats. We've done so many things that people think we're too far in, but we can't pull out. We can pull out and we have got to pull out with children and social media and children and technology and stuff. I think it's it's really quite evident. Gender was the canary in the coal mine of social contagion among in social media, but lots of other things are happening with with young people and social media. Yeah, when I when I was I saw this firsthand in um, when I was living in Argentina, I did a documentary about exorcism, and it was the same thing. Mostly girls for some reason, more girls than boys. Oh, yeah. teenagers 
all thought they had demons inside them and were all going to various different exorcists. And this is a modern country, Argentina. You know, it's pretty modern. Although you go outside of this Buenos Aires city center and it starts to get a little bit different. But the whole of Brazil, whole of Argentina, all the girls, teenage girls. Why is it teenage girls? Because teenage girls are a very are going through certain things that teenage boys aren't going through, which is a sensitivity to their peers, a kind of a, a desire to kind of connect with their peers through verbal, through lots of talking, mm. through an awful lot of co Co, kind of identifying and empathising, ruminating together, talking ad nauseum again. Like I see my own teenage girl and the chat she's having on. And I remember hours spent on the phone as a kid. The words, all all emotions, and you feel that, I feel that too, and all that. So it's completely understandable why, but we have to protect them because teenage girls are an extraordinarily powerful um body, you know what I mean? They can really feel very deep emotions, mm. you know, so can teenage boys, but it's all very different. But the, the contagion is happening with the boys. Shouldn't be underestimated. They're saying it's around about 70, 30 now. It used to be way more girls among these teenage cohort. Now it's not. It's evening. Oh. The boys are coming much more. It seems to me way more boys are coming. Way more parents will contact me about boys these days. And so now they've kind of the general accepted statistic is about 70% girls, 30% boys. And a lot of these boys seem to be groomed online. Oh. Yeah. Well, but we use that word to suggest sort of made, made to be interested in changing the, you know, not, not the, yeah. No, <coughs> maybe that, but certainly, definitely they have been sexualized online. Oh. By older people. Wow. And we know yeah. that. That's like a... No, we don't know that. We don't have research for that. What I have is an awful lot of clinical experience, an awful lot. Because like when I, you know, run in Genspec, you're kind of in touch with an awful lot of um, not only parents, but people who've gone through it. You meet an awful lot of detransitioners. We have an organization within Genspec called Beyond Trans and we get offer funding for detransitioners and people who've been harmed by medical transition. We offer funding for therapy. Mm. And so we have a pool of an awful lot of therapists who are discussing it, an awful lot of people who've been harmed by medical transition who are discussing what led them into it. And they're telling us stories about how they were online and how men you know, treat, sexualize them way before their time and they ended up like dressing up as schoolgirls. They uh, These boys ended up doing sexual acts that honestly you could get a teenage boy to do anything. And so they ended up with a trans identity that seems to have been cultivated. I'm not saying all of them. There's no doubt some of them come in through other ways. There's lots of ways to come in to gender. There's not just one way. And that's one of our big bylines in Genspec, which is there's lots of ways into gender dysphoria. There's lots of ways out. Okay. You know what I mean? So some of them will be just same sex attracted and they'll be very, very feminine. And it just makes sense to them to be a girl. Do you know what I mean? In this culture, that's where it is. Some of them have other things going on. Classic ROGD, rapid onset gender dysphoria, which is a description of a phenomenon. It seems to be hitting uh, lots of boys and lots of girls, which is these are often autistic, very socially awkward, naive, geeky, creative, very, very disconnected from their body, not sexualized at all. And those, that group are really, really, really vulnerable. And this group are very, very vulnerable. They are the ones that we should most be looking out for because these are the geeky, naive sweeties. Oh, man. Yeah. There's so many tragedies in the in this world, but they're the ones that really, because I've met so many of them in my clinical practice and your heart would go out to them. And they're so in earnest. These are very compliant kids, very obedient. They're good kids. And they truly believe you know, in the idea that they are the opposite sex or whatever di- identity, they they really buy in, you know. Why more girls, younger children, and more men seem to transition to want to be women as adults? Um, well, I think the girls seems to be a social contagion. You know what I mean? The teenage girls seems to be rooted in social contagion online. I think that's... Anecdotally, and certainly Lisa Littman's study and, you know, from 2018, it looks like it's it's pretty uh, established. Um, certainly in my work, it is. Uh, the boys, it's very different. Are you talking about the older men? There's always been, do you remember I talked about there's always been a small cohort of children. It was equally, fairly consistently in the last 80 or so years, maybe, maybe longer. 
that have wanted to medically transition. And we don't know, like the research is very scant on this, so we don't really know what's going down and what's been happening. We do know that there's a, a proportion of men who have a condition called autogynephilia, which is an erotic fixation of the idea of yourself being a woman. And it's a paraphilia. So this is like, there's not, well, there's quite a few paraphilias, but there's not many common paraphilias. For example, um, voyeurism is a paraphilia. Exhibitionism is a paraphilia. Pedophilia is a paraphilia. These are sexual mm. disorders that can be incredibly destructive in society. And we as society have put in, you know, measures and sanctions so that if somebody is a voyeur and they're caught, they're put into pr prison, you know what I mean, depending on the severity of their crime, etc. with exhibitionism and definitely with people. And um, autogynephilia is very unknown. It's been successfully suppressed. It's, it's, it was kind of almost named, well, certainly named in 1989 by Ray Blanchard, a, a kind of sexologist researcher. And it's been suppressed again and again and again by trans activists who say that it doesn't exist and by a lot of uh, people who are some people will call them gender critical. I don't know. That word has just become meaning anything at this stage. Sure. I don't even know what gender <coughs> critical is at this stage. But certainly people who who are very um, ner nervous or what the word, they don't like trans activism. Let's say anti-trans activism, for want of a better phrase. Yeah. They uh, want to suppress autogynephilia too. And uh, the reasons why is because they think any sort of conversation like this is normalizing it and sanitizing it. I don't think it is. No. I think I'm bringing to light an extraordinarily uh, destructive condition that the world needs to know about. I was, I, you know, when I was a kid, most people in my area didn't know what pedophilia was. And um, an awful lot of very, very unfortunate things happened as a result. And then in the kind of late 80s, there was a huge amount of scandals, early 90s in Ireland around people. And suddenly people got to know the concept and realised that man is not behaving appropriately. I remember my mom telling me she didn't know what a lesbian was, I think, until she was 40. She was quite innocent, my mom. She's 90 this year. But she was telling me when she had, you know, she was in a pub, very Irish story, and she had the baby on her lap. And um, this man took the baby off her lap, just dandling him on uh, the, the baby on his lap. And she was just having a drink. No big deal. Nothing was happening. And another man came over and took that baby from the man and placed it on my ma's lap, kind of saying, don't let that happen. And my mom was like, what the hell is all that? Years later, she found out that he was a people that man. It was all from the same community. Okay. And the other man knew, but my man didn't even know what a people was. Mm. So didn't know anything, didn't understand anything about that. Just thought basically the second man was very rude. What was the harm? He was only dandling him on his lap. And you'd say a story like that and you think, well, we need to know about. I'm not saying it's the same, but we definitely need to know the concept of, for example, frotterism, which is the men who rub up against you in, mm. in the bus and on the, they don't From do it to you. the French frotte to rub. Is it? Okay. You learn things on this podcast. Every day is a skill day. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so, yeah. So uh, we need to know that that's a condition. That's something you need to call out. If somebody's rubbing up against you, you call a guard, you say something's going down here. The same with voyeurism, exhibitionism, autogynephilia and other things. So that people, can I tell you one more story? I know I talk too much, but no, on this. Yeah. Well, can I just say, and and. and because I'm thinking now I need to sort of make sure people know, and I think th this is what you're saying as well, that not necessarily a high percentage of trans women have AGP. We don't know, okay. and it might be a minority of people, and even those people might not all be necessarily dangerous. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you very much. There you go. We don't know. As usual, we have no research. The research we have is frankly rubbish, very, very low follow-up rates, very, very low quality research. The research is horrendous. So anybody talking confidently about this and says, I just look at the research, frankly, is looking at pretty low quality research and it's, it's all very shoddy. So we don't know. Mm -hmm. However, we do know in 1989, Ray Blanchard distinguished between two groups, which was the homosexual, transsexual, the extreme extremely feminine uh, male who wanted to become a woman, which intuitively kind of makes sense to a lot of people. Mm. And uh, the opposite was, opposite or whatever, the autogynophile, 
So they were the two types. Oh. He classified that in 1989. Immediately it got shushed up. Mike Bailey, uh, uh, another professor, uh, he released a book called The Man Who Would Be Queen in something like 2002 to, to open up this subject. His life got ruined by both, interestingly, both trans activists who called him a Nazi and a people and mm. posted pictures of his children online and said that he was a people. It was pretty awful. And also feminists to this day who uh, call him a pedophile and things like this. Mm. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, both sides really attacked the main man who tried to bring autogynephilia to the masses. So the success at people suppressing this condition has been phenomenal. It's an, an extraordinary, successfully suppressed condition. I don't think it should be suppressed. Like, you know, I established GenSpec to provide a healthy approach to sex and gender. One of the ideas of that would be to talk in a civilised and healthy way with as much accuracy as we can have about the various aspects of gender. So no, not all trans women are autogynophiles. Not all trans women um, have this kind of condition. And we don't even know how intense is autogynephilia for the people who are autogynephilic. I would say we don't know how fully fledged, just to finish that thought, we don't know how fully fledged or how deep in all the autogynephiles are. Some are like clearly incredibly destructive, narcissistic, abusive people. Some don't seem to be. But it feels heretical to say that some don't seem to be. And yet all I can say is we don't know, we don't have research. And when you do point to any research, people say, yeah, they lied. And I'm like, well, maybe they did. What's the point in doing research then if everyone's just <laughs> going to say lie? <laughs> well, what? there is just a pushback. There is uh. evidence that an awful lot of gynophiles are saying I had it since a child. There is evidence that they're rewriting history. Now, there's a lot of evidence that an awful lot of people who kind of subsume themselves or consume themselves in this gender identity say, oh, no, I was always like that. So it's a very common, common trait. Hmm. So it's not as off the wall as you might think. I can actually yeah. imagine, this is the thing with AGP, I can actually imagine it. I'm a man and men have, and I mean, there's something Helen was saying as well, is that, that women need to better understand men's sexuality because it is quite mad particularly when we're like teenagers and stuff, but with a lot of men, it continues into their lives. It's it's not impossible for me imag to imagine getting into a place where, and I don't want to give much away about myself. And I'm not, I'm on honestly, there isn't, I'm a, quite a boring guy, but I can see how that's an attractive, oh, I look down and I'm sort of attracted to myself. Mm. There's like a- So can I, yeah. yeah that's, that's, I, yeah. I hear you, but I think what you and I are saying are, is pretty dangerous these days no. because I think people have become, as a result maybe of a hypersexualized world, They've become very reactionary around this. So any speech about sex is being kind of polarized very fast. Mm. And it is um, immediately you can be called all sorts of names for saying just what you just said, saying I can imagine how somebody would end up there could immediately get you into trouble in a world. Well, screw him. I can't, I just can't, you know, I, if we can't, the whole point is that we can have proper conversations and there, there's so many conversations and I, I won't go into another one, but like about very uh, controversial types of people in this world that when you sit in a pub and you talk to someone, not that I've ever been to a pub in like 15 years, but like it, it sits up and talks to a normal person, almost a hundred percent, they agree with everything you said. And then if you say that in a place like this on Twitter, there's a bunch of very, very angry people who will retweet and go, look what they said. And it's just like, well, what's the point of life if we can't talk about the really controversial things? I didn't say that I do have that attraction to my own genitalia, would it, were it female, uh, nor did I say that that was a good reason to let these men, in fact, it's a bad reason to let them con try and change and go into women's changing rooms and, and get off on it if there is a small percentage of these people who are doing that. So- yeah. And if there are people who are going to then take 15 seconds of this, 15 seconds of you, 15 seconds of you talking to Travis Brown the other yeah. day, and who's a very reasonable person as well. Yeah. I just think screw him. I can't be bothered anymore. I, I'd love to say screw him. Um, <laughs> but it's hard when they're it is. absolutely misrepresenting everything I say. That's the hard thing because you want to say something back. So you go, well, I didn't quite say it. And then someone comes back even more. And then you're in a whole thing. And I think we need to just not reply. But then, oh, but then you're being misrepresented and it's your job. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I've kind of got myself into a, between a, a rock and a hard place with this because 
I suppose I do talk about sex because I think you have to talk about sex oh, if yeah. you're going to talk about gender. And also, I just fundamentally believe in telling the truth. And why set up Jen's Bect if we're not going to have discussions about this? Why would I avoid autogynophilia, which is such a massive impact on this whole situation? Mm-hmm. It would be so disingenuous of me to just say, which many organisations do, we'll stay away from that because it's a minefield and we'll be shot by our own side. Mm. And so we don't. And as a result, I get an awful lot of grief um, from people. Like you say 15 seconds, like literally a, a, a fellow psychotherapist who knows me very well and knows my my work um, chose to clip 17 seconds of me speaking with Travis Brown the other day and um, I was literally in the middle of a sentence. Literally. And what was it they had you say? Because I, I think I, I saw I it. I should know it because it's been quoted at me so much, but I can't think of it, but I'll try and do... Uh, you might have it on no, your don't. But um, <laughs> it was along the lines of um, lesbians might get a sexual charge from wearing certain clothes. And, you know, I... I strongly believe that we're all sexual beings. And as a heterosexual woman, I'm fully entitled to get a sexual charge from wearing certain clothes. And you are too. And everybody is. And lesbians are. Heterosexual women are. David Beckham does that. Yeah, does he? That was like a thing. Yeah, but we were... Well, does he get a sexual charge? We don't know. He would wear... I know, he wore dresses. I don't mean he he wore... um, I remember, sarong. No, no, no. I don't mean that though. I mean he would wear... Apparently would wear Posh's, Victoria Beckham's underwear had to get a thrill out of it. They, they said this. This was Did a they? less judgmental time. Yeah. I, I, I might be misquoting it, so don't sue me, David Beckham, but I'm pretty sure he was being interviewed on Parkinson or she was being interviewed and, and just said I, and just said he wears he wears. I presume difference. you're not changing David Beckham's identity. There. What, to, to Parkinson? <laughs> when you said she was being interviewed. Oh, no. Well, he's, he became a she in that moment and posh became the, a posh person. If she can become posh, then... Um, you know... I think that's really interesting because I would like, I I feel really quite strongly about this because I've been told, you know, I've been told I've been transphobic for the last seven years or Mm -hmm. so now. And I fended off that accusation by being very careful with my words. I was really careful when I first came out. I was tiptoeing through a minefield. As the years have gone on, I've I've completely relaxed about that because the world has changed. So I don't have to be half as intense as I used to have to be around all my words and watching it and watching it and watching it. And I've really enjoyed that freedom. But in recent times, suddenly my own side have absolutely, well, they've ran a a very extensive smear campaign against me. For reasons I don't know, but I've plenty to speculate about. But ultimately, they're trying to call me different names. And this week, they came up with homophobic and lesbophobic. Because you said because lesb- I said some lesbians, lesbians might get a charge out of wearing clothes. And I'm like, yeah, in the context of it, what I was trying to say was we can't police people's clothes. And women are entitled to get a sexual charge out of yeah. clothes. And men are entitled to get a sexual charge. Everybody is because we're sexual beings. Right now, outside, there's people on the bus thinking sexual thoughts. There's mm. people in cars thinking Disgusting. sexual thoughts. When you're walking by, people yeah. are thinking things. Two, uh, you know, eyes are connecting and sexual thoughts are happening and we walk on by. It's happening all the time because we're sexual beings and that's okay. So long as people are behaving appropriately, that's all we can police. We mm. can't police the way they wear their clothes. So long as it's within the limits of human decency, I don't think we can pl- police their clothes. Other people think, for example, Kelly J recommended that for any future conference that Jen Specht has, we should have a uh, business attire. Um, and that would mean that we would actually police clothes and you, young man with your velvet jacket, get out of here. Mm. Way too... This is business. No, it's not. It's a business of a... <laughs> looks, it looks a bit sexual to me now, man, Sonny. <laughs> man, on a, man on a street sort of business. So so it's... The, yeah, I immediately would push back and say, well, is this a man wearing eyeliner? Is this a man wearing a silky sh- shirt? Or a I used to jacket? wear eyeliner because I, I used to... I eyeliner. I watched The Killers and Green Day. You were cool. I was cool. Well, that was never cool, though, was it? Because it was too mainstream and, you know, it was before Coldplay got... I liked them before they were mainstream or whatever everyone used to say. I was never cool. But I used to play guitar and I'd put the eyeliner. It's lovely. Eyeliner's lovely. I look brilliant. Yeah. I think eyeliner is kind of great on most people. But it didn't make me think I was a woman. But could I go back to this because <laughs> it's been very serious allegation. Like I was called transphobic for so many years and you know it was really awful for those years because back then it was a serious accusation. I was an unknown psychotherapist in the middle of rural Ireland and my life could have been <clears throat> ruined many times over because I chose to put my name to this. When many people have the 
privilege of anonymity where they can be very hardline over pronouns while at the same time saying, I can't be, uh, I can't put my name to it because I'd lose my job. And I'm like, I ran the risk of losing not only my job, but my reputation, my good name. And I ran it very severely for many, many years over this issue. And um, I, I am definitely cancelled in many places in the world. And often, you know, my book came out and the national broadcaster in Ireland wouldn't um, have a bar of me mm. because I was considered transphobic. So I'm well used to being cancelled. But being told that I was homophobic or lesbophobic this week, anybody who would look at my work, I have thousands of hours of, of footage. I've got a, a podcast, Gender Wider Lens, hours and hours and hours of me and Sasha Ayad, the other co-host talking about sex and gender, sex and gender, sex and gender. I have thousands of words written and I'm like, how dare they, frankly? How dare this thing? Well, it's libelous. Clip 17 seconds and call me lesbophobic. It is libelous. Yeah. It's, it's definitely libelous. Mm. It's, that is infuriating. And that's the thing. It's all well and good for me to say, oh, just ignore it, just ignore it. But it is your job. And I've had similar, I mean, it's a different job I have, but I've had times when I've reached out to maybe famous people to come on the podcast and a whole barrage of people saying, he's a racist, transphobic, such and such with no evidence. And I don't know if those people, because I never got a reply from that famous person. Maybe they did see that and thought, I don't want to be involved with this person. Well, that's, that is literally defamation. I mean, there's no clear example and of what's happening to you. It literally will stop some people from going and, and taking your services as a psychotherapist. Oh, further than that, um, I often give an awful lot of mental health talks. They'll stop that. Yeah. I write books. I write for different kind of outlets. So there's an awful lot of different ways that it will harm me. And for, for somebody to do it who knows my work and chose to kind of cut and just make half a sentence and act as if it was the end of an interview. We'd been, it was 59 minutes in. We talked about this and that and the other. You're coming to the end and you're trying to make a complicated point. This is such a complex world. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to say people get a sexual charge out of wearing clothes and that's okay. And if a man wants to come to the Genspec conference, which he did in November, and he wants to wear a ball gown, Frankly, there's not very much we can do about it because if we stopped to mentoring, he would get we would get sued and he would win. Yeah. And if we decided to kind of cast him out, that would be legally kind of very very dodgy. If we tried to hide the fact that he was there, that would be dishonest. And so we were kind of caught. So I think we we might have handled it badly. I think we, we certainly know an awful lot more now, three months later, than we knew then about how to handle that. I don't think any other organisation had handled it. It was very interesting that the main person who was criticised me at the time was Kelly J. Keane. Yeah. And she said very flippantly when we had a conversation on the Benjamin Boys, she said very flippantly, oh, well, I can't stop autogynophiles, you know, coming in dresses to my conference. I, I don't know what she said. She said something like, she definitely didn't say conference because she has these kind of events, open air events. And mm. she said, I can't stop anybody coming to my open air events because I was pointing out that different people had come to her events. And she said, there's nothing I can do about that. But we would shame them in the pub afterwards. And I'm like... Well, bully for you. Don't don't come into my conference and talk about how you can't do it for yours, but we should do it for that's like one rule for the, me I and another and shame rule for them. thee. Go and shame and bully them after. I don't know if that's going to help anyone. Well, I said that to Kelly. I said, yeah. do you really think it's it's a, a best way to win people around to your ideas by being so fervent and vehement? And she sort of quoted, well, she cited Nigel Farage and Donald Trump, and she was saying, look, by being that way, you can convince people. And she, well, you know. well, you know, I think there's many ways to skin a cat, mm. okay? There's many ways to kind of get anything across the line. I think we need all the different ways. There's lots of different ways to go at it. Some people might hold the line. Some people might spend their day on Twitter um, arguing different points around different things. Some people might choose to remain anonymous. Some people might choose to put their name to it and risk their reputation and their lives, livelihoods. There's lots of different ways and I think everybody has a part to play. But I don't think it's very helpful to denigrate other people's efforts because you think your effort is the best. We'll know in about 20 years what was the most effective strategy. It's a purity spiral. That's what it is. You know, somebody was messaging last night on Twitter about you. Oh, don't you know she's a homophobe and all that. I actually privately messaged them. It's an anonymous person with a silly name, which I won't say because I don't want, you know. And I said, well, what was it? What, what is it that Stella said? Because, you know, I'm going to interview you. I have to know. 
And she said, oh, or they said, you know, she said this and that. And I don't know, maybe showed me the link of you, the 20 seconds, which I thought, well, that seems fine to me. I don't know. And what was funny was I said, well, and I want to reiterate, I said some, something like some lesbians get a sexual charge out of wearing clothes. Yeah, well, obviously they do. Obviously Why some do. They? There's 8 billion people They're who are, of some lesbians to. do. But lots of women do too. Yeah, well, that's great. I don't, I didn't think, do. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. But then... The the Twitter person, I said, well, I'll talk to Stella about it tomorrow then. And that person said, oh, she'll just explain herself. And it's like, that <laughs> is the best phrase for our times, isn't it? She'll just explain it and that's it. It's like, well, great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all tribal. It's, it's, can I just say, just yeah. for, it's been really sad. It's It's been a horrible event for me. Oh, yeah, but you just, I no, I, I can't keep saying you've got to just ignore it because it, it does hurt. It does hurt. And I hope that you're okay. Um where can people follow you and, and help? I'm easily found on Stella Malley or Jen Specht. We're easily, very easily found. Okay. And who is a heretic that you admire? Paul McHugh is on my mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. He's a doctor and he's 92. I'm very keen to talk to him. He took on John Money in the 1970s. John Money was a terrible abuser of, of young people and brought in gender identity. He took him on closed down the gender identity clinic in 1979. Then in the 90s, Paul McHugh cropped up again because recovered memory syndrome was happening. And he was part of the person who created the false memory syndrome. And he took that down. This man is, a, a, is an unacknowledged hero that I think more people should have respect for. Fascinating. Paul McHugh. People, check out Paul McHugh. Check out Stella's work. We'll put some uh, links and things and you can check out Gen Specs and all that. Um, hit the like button and share this around because I think this does... We had a nuanced, good conversation, actually. So keep watching more nuanced conversations and get this all out into the world.